Uh, so is the microphone on? I usually don't have any trouble being heard, as I often tell people I was a camp counselor for a long time. So I can scream at a large quantity of children and have them uh, hear me pretty well. Uh, as it says mostly right there, uh, I've done this stuff for a long time. Um, it almost sounds sometimes like I know what I'm doing. Um, I also like to point out this is my youngest son, Ian, who is mostly into Pokemon. Uh, and Minecraft, um, and he definitely knows what he's doing. So this talk is a little bit of a story to try to give you an idea of the use cases for uh, this technology that we have been working on at Red Hat for some number of years uh, called software collections. So it's always better if you have kind of an example to get an idea of what the point of something is. So what we start off with, I don't know about any of you, I take a lot of public transportation. If you're taking public transportation late at night, maybe there was some drinking involved, there's a tendency to perhaps fall asleep on the train. Uh, the other big problem actually I have is that um, I'll, I have a relatively long commute home, and so I'll actually be working on the train, and uh, do, I, I don't notice that my stop has come by, and invariably I notice right after uh, I get past my house, uh, which of course is a long bridge. So this application is the Wake Me Up app. So uh, there's all kinds of apps out there that use uh, basically the predictive modeling of the real-time GPS systems to tell you uh, when the train is coming, but very few will tell you when to get off. Uh, this has actually come in handy uh, in when I travel around, right? So in places like Brno, where I don't speak Czech, it makes it a little easier to find which station to get off at. So of course, we build the app, and then we sell the app. Profits go through the roof. Everything's great, uh, but we start to make some money, right? So now the problem is we have made some money. We realize that we want to start thinking about maybe creating a new version. All right, well, the problem, as I'm sure you've all experienced, is that even though you're working on a new version, the old version still has bugs, right? It still has complaints. It still wants features, et cetera. So the problem is, how do you work on both versions at the same time? So we have lots of different options. Um, I think the most classic one used is the one on the right, which is prayer, that it's just going to work, and then maybe you can put them next to each other. Maybe you can have one machine that you keep around for the old dev, you know, uh, and everything is just going to be perfectly happy and hunky-dory. Uh, the other common one is, you know, kind of, uh, you see this in Linux uh, sometimes where basically you actually install multiple versions. So this particular application was written in Python, so that's even more, or that's even harder in a sense, uh, just because so much of the actual OS is run in Python. So introduce software collections as another alternative. So what a software collection does is it kind of, tricks your application into thinking that uh, the version that you're using is the system version. So as a result, we get a package that kind of looks like this. So at the top, uh, I'm usually able to point, and it's high above me. So, um, And uh, I should have just used overheads. It would be more fun. So in the normal scheme of things, so this is actually talking about Ruby, uh, if you kind of look at the top half, you see that the uh, Ruby normally installs kind of under user bin, um, and you know its libraries go under lib and all that stuff. With the software collection, it does exactly the same thing, except it puts it all under a directory called opt, um, and then uh, kind of underneath our directory, because this happens to be a software collection that Red Hat made, but it doesn't have to be under RH. Uh, and then basically replicates the root. Then you also kind of have off to the side there a, um, a kind of an enabling script, which is what gets run when you do the thing at the bottom. So this is how you actually make it go. You say SCL enable whatever the package is that you want, you know, whatever or whatever the version named thing is, uh, and then the application you want to run. 
as a developer, that's often just bash, right? So that you can go and you know start say Eclipse, or you can go and start say a web server, uh, so that you it's already in the context of that uh, software collection. Feel free to ask questions at any time. I like getting yelled at. No throwing things. So that's kind of roughly how they work. These are some of the software collections. I, I was looking through them, and I, I found some, actually, that I didn't realize were in there. Uh, so there's a bunch here. Uh, as you can see, we have a lot of the major uh, kind of web development languages. There's also GCC here. There is uh, a bunch of databases. And then kind of off on the right, we kind of have some weirder other things that you would like newer versions of on, on RHEL um, that may not be available, so like Eclipse. Um, I just came across Jetty, which I didn't actually realize was there. Uh, I don't know if there's any Java developers here. Um, but Jetty's kind of cool. Lucene is super cool. So there's just kind of some of those out there as well. So then you kind of get into deployment. OK, well, the kind of cool thing about these software collections is that you know, right now, today, you can deploy them on RHEL, with, you know, RHEL 6 with the software collections kind of packaged and installed. Um, it's actually slightly wrong, I just realized. So some of those are actually in another, that we, we kind of have two products. One is called Developer Toolset, and one is called Red Hat Software Collections. In Red Hat Software Collections are mostly all the web tool stuff. And then in Developer Tool stuff is the uh, more like the C and C++ things. So that's kind of how you deploy it. Um, the other neat part, though, is that for a lot of these software collections, OpenShift actually uses them inside as well. So if you have an application that you wrote in, say, Ruby, uh, and you kind of do your development or deployment into kind of a more traditional model onto, onto RHEL, well, that's cool. And then sooner or later, somebody stands up an OpenShift instance uh, internally, or you decide to start using OpenShift.com, well, you can pick up the app and just drop it there because it's the same stuff underneath. So there's some configuration differences, but from a technical perspective, it's basically the same stuff. This isn't strictly true for all the software collections because the OpenShift guys are, are trying to consume them from us in, on the enterprise Linux land as fast as possible, but they're all, not all one-to-one -one yet. So now we have a way to kind of work on two things at the same time without having to kind of hope and pray and, and hope that it works out. So we get you know, rainbows. Uh, I particularly like this picture because it's rainbows in a train station. Um, but So I just kind of, that's, you know, basically kind of the crux of it. Uh, and I want to just kind of potentially show you guys. Um, the hard thing about doing this talk is that there's not a lot to see. Because kind of the whole point is that the code is exactly the same as it would be normally. So, you know, we have, oops, I still can't quite get a hold of the, uh, I am running RHEL 7 beta. Uh, and I'm still not quite used to, uh, so like here's some of the code, right? And yeah, it looks like Python. It probably looks like bad Python, because uh, I don't really know Python very well. I just kind of learned it to, to write this app. Uh, and uh, I don't really actually know any language. I've just done them all at some point or another and done something in production and then waited for bug reports. Um, but, you know, like, it doesn't look like anything. So that's kind of what's hard about this. So I, I can also kind of show you. Um, let's see if I can make this actually show you guys something over here. So if you kind of look here, actually, let's do this first. So, yeah, that's tough, right? I mean, yeah, so I installed Python 3.3. I got Python 3.3. Then I do this SCL enable thing, right? I drop in a bash, but before I do that, I'll, you know, here's the proof in the pudding, right? That whole thing. Uh, assuming I can type, nope. Right, so user bin Python. Um, so let me know it's uh, Python V, right? Oh boy. I want to what? Uh, oh, capital V. 
Nope, not there. Usually I do this better. I'm not used to having to look up over my shoulder. So Python 2.6, and uh, then this is the only thing that you know I, of course, find very confusing is that I can't hit up arrow anymore. Um, again, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I'm not that bright. Uh, so, but there you go, Python 3.3. Again, doesn't look like anything, not particularly interesting, except it's really, really, really powerful if you start to think this way, right? So that's basically what I wanted to show you guys. Um, you know, there's also, um, wanted to show you guys, oops, yeah. If you run what? Yum. Uh, well, it's just bash, so it should work just fine. Um, you're not really, well, actually, no, it won't, because it's Python, right? Yeah, good call. Uh, yeah, that'd be fun. Uh, I haven't actually tried that. I should try experimenting with that and see how badly I could break my machine. It does work? Ah, uh, okay. So somebody was smarter than me, because I would have made that bug. Uh, so... Um, so I just wanted to show you if I can figure out how to get these slides to start up again. Um, apparently not. Uh, just uh, there's a couple other talks about kind of related stuff, uh, so definitely check these out. Are there any other questions besides ones that are meant to troll? <laughs> like I said, really straightforward. You guys can build them yourselves. Um, you can. Uh, one of the things that we've been working on is that there's not a good place to kind of go find a community around this. Uh, right now, there is the, the closest thing to it is, uh, it's actually, a, the bit.ly link is, uh, it's bit.ly slash fedora dash SCL, um, but it's a much longer name wiki page at Fedora that has like kind of links to a lot of the kind of temp ones to try out. Um, in if you running rel, you can get them from a channel called Red Hat Software Collections or from the DTS one. Um, and uh, there's also, it's also been bundled for uh, CentOS, uh, so they're also available there. Uh, so if you want to check them out, they're out there. They just, the community part, we're still working on trying to get like a place for it to live uh, so that people can participate. Go ahead. Right. Well, we actually, so what we've been working on is actually an independent community so that there's like upstream and then Fedora would be a consumer and CentOS could be a consumer and RHEL could be a consumer and hopefully other people start to be consumers as well. Um, so that's what we're trying to build, and we're trying to build it essentially with copper so that you can kind of just upload your source and then just say, okay, I want to build for RHEL or I want to build for CentOS or I want to build for Fedora. Um, and then if the individual distributions want to do changes uh, because there's something different so that they can ship it in their normal uh, channels, either, you know, repositories, whatever the right word is, um, they can do that as well. So that's the idea. Well, that's, that is actually what it does. So if you convert it to be SCL supported, um, except for apparently a couple of bugs, um, you should actually be able to build it as a non-SCL RPM as well. So the goal is that someday all of the RPMs will be SCL enabled, or like, or SCL buildable. Right, right. But you need some data in the spec file, uh, so somebody has to go through and touch every spec file to get that data in there. Oh, so I guess uh, for the most part, you know, spec to SEL works, but not quite always, so is the problem. You know, it's only 90% or whatever. I don't know, how, how good's the percentage? 
86, uh, to be specific. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? So if you want to if you want to have multiple so the way it works right is that you run SEL enable and then whichever thing you want for a context and then your application. So if you had six applications that all wanted to use Python 3.3, I would probably recommend that you actually run SEL enable three times or six times with the Python 3.3 for each one. Unless there's some reason that they need to be able to communicate like in process. Does that make sense? Good. So I often have a slide in, in the talks I give about this try, explaining the difference between this solution to this problem and the 500 other solutions to this problem. Um, so update alternatives is, uh, basically that was the question was specifically how does this compare to update alternatives? Well, update alternatives um, solves the same problem with kind of the trade-off in reverse. So what it does is it says, I want this whole machine to switch to this new version or old version of thing X. So that anytime you run anything on the machine, um, it would be using the, uh, you know, the different version than the one that was installed. Let's say, for example, we went to Tim's example, he said, you know, we have six applications that are using you know, Ruby 2, right? Well, it might make sense actually to do update alternatives and switch the system to Ruby 2, assuming nothing in the actual OS uses Ruby 2. And then we have that one application that's still using Ruby 1.8, but well, we could use an SCL to do Ruby 1.8, right? So they, they're, they're kind of complementary. Um, you know, they kind of do, like I said, they do the reverse of each other. Well, so I, as a uh, SEC managed person, I'm not allowed to make forward-looking statements about anything ever. Um, but I would point out there are two versions of Python here. If that's any indication of what might possibly happen in the future. All right. Yes. Uh, again, with the forward-looking statements, but. Uh, I think it's unlikely because on RHEL 5 is getting very close to end of life. So it's a, the benefits are rough. You know, if there's, if there's enough customers wanting to pay for something, that also changes opinions. Any other questions? You can ask more. I'm fine. All right, all right. So I have a hard time with this talk because it either sometimes takes forever to get through it and sometimes it goes really quickly. So it looks like we're leaning towards quickly today. Um, yeah. So one of the things, so what Slavic was mentioning is that um, you can also kind of take your application now and create it as a software collection that is dependent on other software collections. Um, part of the reason I don't normally mention that too much is because our documentation on doing that is iffy at best. Um, so we would like to, I, I would like to make sure that we have a strong recommendation about how to do it um, before we kind of suggested to everyone about how they go about it. Um, so that's a concern. But it is, I mean, ultimately that's the goal is that, you know, when you ship your application, you can ship it with, you know, essentially still uh, some dynamism to the components, but make it for the end customer a very seamless experience. Uh, 
theoretically, I can show you. Um, uh, but you just list them both, I assuming you want both. So what I do is I gotta really change my bash so that it'll tell me which ones are like enabled already. Um, but you just would say, um, what is it called? I think it's Postgres QL. Was it nine two? Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, I just was hoping to just guess. Um, and then I can say, uh, wait, it's uh, P, P, G, SQL, P, P, SQL. Yeah, so, so now I have both, right? You know, and ad infinitum. Um, I'm not sure I quite follow, but basically what this will do is that when the, when the script calls user bin Python at the top, it will get the new one, right? The one you SCL'd into, because <laughs> he's shaking his head. Why? That's the, that, sorry. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry, yeah. If you, if you explicitly declare the full path to it, you will get the, the, the old one. If you just use Python, sorry, set it backwards. Right, you, well, generally speaking, at least, at least for all of this kind of stuff to work, for any of this kind of trickery to work, um, you, you know, even, even update alternatives, right? You've gotta use just Python. If you give an explicit path, then the OS can't decide where to give you that result from. Just Python. The other problem here is, of course, I'm, I'm mostly a web developer, so the, uh, you know, I don't write too many scripts that are actually, you know, do real work, um, so. All right, anything else? Uh, apparently, they got approved last week with some considerations. Oh wait, was that two weeks ago? Maybe it was two weeks ago now. Uh, I've been on the road for a bit. Uh, so they're getting there. Uh, but I mean, it depends on what you mean, right? I, like you can use them in Fedora anytime you want, right? It's the, but uh, having them be part of the kind of mainline distribution is still a little messy. All right, well thanks all for coming. Um, and like I said, we have this dev program uh, for Red Hat and, uh, you know, for Enterprise Linux. Um, we have a blog where, oh, come on, seriously? Um, I'm going to file a bug for LibreOffice. Um, so we have a blog. We talk about a lot of this stuff, how to use this stuff. Uh, we also do some videos on YouTube kind of with various presentations and stuff, um, Twitter, et cetera. So check it out. Uh, and uh, as I started to say, thanks for coming. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.
No, did I miss? I must have misread it. I thought I had less time. No. <laughs> no. <bro. laughs> oh well. Yeah, I haven't seen Partisan in 40 movies. No, even better. Oh, that's a good idea. You know, I keep, I really like ZSH, um, but I never switched to it because I, when I was consulting, I was always getting, you know, you always get new machines. And so actually investing in any non-standard setup is hard. But now that I don't do that as much anymore, I should switch. Yeah, so, but that's a good idea. One of the nice things that it does is it's yeah. very if you don't have to do shells. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. I only just switched the other day. I switched for like three months several years ago. But uh, yeah, I should try it again. You know you're still speaking on the microphone, right? Oh.